History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to History Ghost Bump Redux. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're going to be revisiting the Morse Mill Hotel. And, you know, so many years has passed sometimes when we feature these locations that things have changed a lot. The Morse Mill Hotel had been refurbished and reopened as a, I guess you could call it a bed and breakfast. It was an inn. A lot of paranormal investigators would go here to investigate. And so it was on a lot of people's wish list for a place to go to. Well, over the past, I'd say, year and a half, it's been a private residence. So it's no longer open to the public. Oh, that's disappointing. Which is a bummer. When you guys hear about the history and the hauntings going on here, maybe someday it will be open for us to be able to do some ghost hunts there again. We hope you enjoy this revisit of the Morse Mill Hotel. Are you ready to go back, Kelly? I'm ready. The Morris Mill Hotel in Dittmer, Missouri, has it all for history and ghost enthusiasts alike. This location has not only served as a private residence, tavern, and inn, but also as a hospital for the Confederate wounded during the Civil War. And during Prohibition, this building was both a speakeasy and a brothel. A female serial killer has been connected to the Morris Mill Hotel as well. This nearly 200-year-old structure is full of surprises and, quite possibly, ghosts. Join us for the history and hauntings of the Morris Mill Hotel. The first structure built on this property was a one-bedroom house in 1816 that served as a residence for a farmer. The area had once been a Native American burial ground and had been ruled by the Spanish under the Louisiana Territory. By 1816, the region was known as the Missouri Territory. William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition served as the territorial governor. In 1847, bridge engineer and entrepreneur John H. Morse settled the area, and built a grist mill along the shores of the beautiful Big River, naming it Morse Mill. That mill was the longest running and most prosperous mill in the state of Missouri. The mill would give the city of Morse Mill its name as well. Morse bought the farm property at that time and expanded the house to 5,300 square feet and three stories, building it from limestone and maple. The house has a New Orleans-style balcony and widow's walk. Unfortunately, the date that the Morse homestead was built is hard to track down. We found dates ranging from 1847 to 1856 or the early 1870s. Needless to say, Kelly, it's an old house. (laughs) Indeed. John Morris joined the Confederate Army when the Civil War broke out. The home became a makeshift hospital for the Confederate prisoners of war and possibly a stop on the Underground Railroad. After the Civil War, Morris opened a contracting business and built the Sandy Creek Covered Bridge that still stands today and resembles a long red barn. It's very cool. It reminds me a lot of Saks Bridge. Very much so. He later went on to become a state senator representing the counties of Jefferson and Washington. As if that was not enough, Morris opened two general stores as well. Morris had big visions for Morris Mill. 
He knew the area would make a fine retreat for tourists, but he did not live to witness the future playground for the rich, famous, and infamous his home would become. When Morse died, his home became the Riverside Hotel, and it was expanded further to make room for 18 guest rooms and a fourth floor was added. The entire town of Morse Mill became a thriving tourist town. The hotel became a hot spot for many people looking to find relaxation near the waters of the Big River. The hotel saw its most success during the 20s and 30s. I can just hear the Charleston now in the background. (laughs) And look at the floor, Kelly. There's guests like Charles Lindbergh, Charlie Chaplin, actress Clara Bow, Al Capone, and J. Frank Dalton. Do you know who Dalton is? Not off the top of my head. Well, Dalton is an interesting character. He claimed to be Jesse James. And although his claims did not hold up under the scrutiny of James' family members, many people do believe he was the real deal. And when he died in 1951 at 103, whoa, that's a long life, his death certificate recorded his name as Jesse Woodson James. A sheriff by the name of Orrin Baker went to the funeral home where Dalton was taken and confirmed that he was indeed Jesse James based on markings on his body, including a missing fingertip. Dalton's gravestone bears the name of Jesse James as well. If we believe this, then Jesse James visited the Morse Mill Hotel. The official website for the hotel claims that Jesse James and his gang left their names in the register along with doodles. You want to know why they did that, Kelly? Tell me, Diane. (laughs) (laughs) Shall I tell you? Apparently, one of his gang members was a cartoonist. So those doodles aren't just little like, you know, just a circle or a square or whatever. It's actually characters. Well, they were scoundrels, but that's quite entertaining. Yes. (laughs) During Prohibition, the hotel was the perfect location for a speakeasy. The whiskey that was served was Al Capone's whiskey. But Al Capone was not the most infamous character to be tied to Morris Mill and the hotel. That distinction goes to Bertha Gifford, who was born near Morris Mill in 1876. Bertha's family was a Christian family and well-known. In her 20s, Bertha married a man named Henry Graham, and they took on the managing of the Morris Mill Hotel. Graham became ill and died. It would be years before people would surmise that Bertha killed Graham with arsenic. No. Yes. It was murder. Murder. Arsenic would put Bertha in the annals of female serial killers, and she became quite prolific. After Graham died, Bertha married Jean Gifford, a man she was rumored to be having an affair with. They moved to Catawissa, which was several miles away, in 1911. That same year, Bertha went to the Pacific Pharmacy and purchased a large amount of arsenic for rats, (laughs) quote-unquote. Yeah, I'm sure she was killing some rats. Well, maybe the size of Chuck E. Cheese. (laughs) <laughs> well, that could be. <laughs> in 1917, she would also make large purchases of arsenic from the Powers Pharmacy. Bertha was known to be a great cook, and she made great candy. Candy that killed. Ooh, that sucks, because I love candy. <laughs> Not this candy. <laughs> yes, indeed. Bertha poisoned several children with her arsenic candies. What a special, a, hmm. yeah, there's special, a special bit place of, for her. Yeah, special bit of evil, that one. Sherman Pounds was a drunk who spent some time at the Giffords farm. He died after some violent stomach pains, but people assumed it was the alcohol that got him. His granddaughter died in the same house several years later. Bertha made potions, too, that she administered to people on their sickbed. Jean's mother died, and then his younger brother. Jim Ogle, a hired hand they owed money, came down with malaria or something, and Bertha nursed him to death. The deaths started to pile up, and anywhere between 17 to 26 are credited to her. And I bet most people have never even heard of her. I hadn't. She was finally arrested in 1928 and charged with the murders of one man, Edward Brimley, and two boys, Elmer and Lloyd Shamel, seven and nine years old, respectively. She was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was locked up in an asylum until her death there in 1951. Her death certificate reveals she had been diagnosed with paranoid psychosis. She is buried in Morse Mill Cemetery, where a lot of her victims are also buried. So I need to look into the cemetery. I bet it's haunted. I would imagine so. New highways were built, and resorts in the Ozarks became more appealing. 
Morris Mill lost its luster as it became a declining town with much of it washing away in a flood in 1993. In 2010, Patrick Sheehan bought the Morris Mill Hotel and completely restored it from top to bottom. The hotel had been open for paranormal investigations, events, and lodging, but is currently closed to the public as it's become a private residence in September of 2022, as Diane said. With a robust history like this, paranormal activity should be plentiful, and based on the many anecdotal stories and a feature on Travel Channel's most terrifying places in America 6, that does seem to be the case. Back in the day, Don Conan was a tour guide at the Morse Mill Hotel. And she once said, the paranormal activity here, oh my God, it is unbelievable. It's crazy. We have everything. And I mean everything. It's an amazing place. That's why I'm like, oh man, I can't believe this place is closed down. Well, you never know. In 2008, a paranormal group made a documentary named Morse Mill Project. The group claimed that something unseen played with their camera equipment moving it. They reportedly saw a tall, dark shadow figure and a fire poker was bent into a curve by something not seen. What? And there's a picture here, Kelly, where you can see that poker. It's a pretty big curve. It's not just a little one. It looks like it's been kind of wrapped around the midsection of somebody. Yeah. And pokers are not easy to bend. Oh, I mean, heck no. Usually you see them used in like movies where they're like stabbing somebody with it. <laughs> stabbing or walloping well, and they don't bend. <laughs> when we're watching a horror movie and they're in a house, I'm always like, grab the poker because there's always a poker by the fireplace, you know. True story, folks. <laughs> she really does that I every do. time. <laughs> Get the poker. <laughs> well, don't leave it down there. Pick it back up. <laughs> Hit him again. <laughs> she gets very passionate. This is why I can't watch horror movies in a theater because I'm always screaming at the person. How can you be so <laughs> stupid? That's a true story, too. <laughs> And they heard several strange sounds, including a loud metallic sound. A couple of the people were scratched as well. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. Patrick had gotten used to the paranormal activity, even though he had no idea that the place was haunted when he bought it. Disembodied footsteps were a common occurrence at what he took on as a project. Glowing orbs were seen, doors opened and closed on their own, locks are locked and unlocked, and apparitions have been seen. A group that included police officers investigated the hotel in February 2015, and they reported, The K2 and flashlight sitting on display cabinet started lighting as soon as turned on and placed on case. One officer thought he heard someone whispering behind him. He turned around and no one was there. One of the young girls felt dizzy and had to sit down all of a sudden. She felt better after moving to a different area. Whoever wrote this also says, We kept hearing noise outside the window while I was giving history. I actually stopped and had Dawn go outside to check the noise. No explanation and it started again after she came in. One of the officers is part of a SWAT team and he brought his night vision glasses. While I was finishing the history, he started to see a figure behind the large upright display case. At first, all that he could see was the legs. At least two of the other officers looked and agreed that it wasn't a reflection of any of us in the room. Several of the group tried the dousing rods. They all received responses to the questions they were asking while holding the rods. I had placed a flashlight on the stairs, and while we were using the dousing rods, the flashlight started going on and off in response instead. Now, I know that Dawn is the uh, tour guide that I just mentioned, so this could be another tour guide that usually had been working with her, who was named Maribeth, or it could have actually been Patrick, who also led tours as well. And Dawn had brought her son on a tour once. And, you know, Kelly, we always say, don't be mean to the spirits, don't tempt the spirits, or don't disrespect a ghost. They decided they wanted to do the flashlight experiment. So they set that up, and Dawn says... Her son, who was named Alec, asked, are you a female? And the flashlight didn't come on. So then he said, are you a male? And the flashlight came on. Okay, can you turn it off? He asked, and the flashlight goes off. Then his next question was, do you have a son? And the flashlight came on. Alec decided to be kind of cheeky. He was 19 years old. It was his first time on a ghost tour, so he muttered under his breath, I'll beat his ass. When Alec said that, the flashlight turned off, 
And then Alex said, my neck is burning. We shined the flashlight on him and he had a scratch three and a half inches long that welted. Well, I guess you shouldn't have said you were going to beat his ass. (laughs) Not very respectful, was it? Don reported that kid was followed the rest of the night and received three more scratches on his body. Well, I'm just going to say again. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you get what you get. A ghost by the name of Annabelle, who claims to be a 12-year-old, lives in the attic. The entity purportedly plays with toys brought by investigators. However, we did find other investigators that reported that this spirit claims to be five or six years of age. In the basement is a room that contains shackles and a body was buried there. The ghost of a former slave is reported to haunt this area. Clattering of cooking implements are heard in the kitchen. Both of the Giffords are thought to haunt the location, but we doubt that. Bertha's first husband, Henry Graham, would be more likely. Yeah, because Bertha didn't die here, so I don't know why she would return back to here. Spirits have been witnessed outside of the house, too. Many groups have recorded EVPs. Most experiences are not negative. There are claims that at least 20 spirits are on the property. And there was a picture that was shared, and it has this image that was captured on the attic stairs. It kind of looks like a little girl in a dress. It does. Yeah, it looks like she's hanging on the banister and kind of leaning back and looking Mm -hmm. down. Yeah, that's the way I see it. If it's the real deal, of course, we didn't take the picture, and I always have a hard time trusting that stuff, so I don't know. Kat and her sister investigated in September of 2021, and they had quite a bit of activity. They started in the basement, and their EMF devices went off like crazy, and their flashlight turned off and on. They kept hearing odd noises, slight bangs, thumps, and other noises. Kat then caught the scent of death, which later changed to the scent of flowers. Now, I find that interesting because when you think about it, if they had people who were in the parlor or whatever, you would kind of get that scent of death. But then also they would be trying to cover it over with all the flowers. That's why we have flowers at funerals. True. And so it makes you wonder if it's not that they're kind of getting some kind of residual from trying to beat both of those scents back with each other. Get the death scent overpowered with the flower scent. They then turned on an ovalus and they got the name Henry who was possibly Bertha Gifford's first husband, Henry Graham. The next word was Riley. I guess they were trying to talk to our dog. (laughs) Perhaps. And then Jason. And Jason supposedly was the name of one of the Morse family members. Maybe it's him. They also got the word stuck. Kat's ears suddenly started to ring loudly. They got similar activity in the attic and Annabelle's room. They wrote, Then Kat inhaled deeply as if shocked and said, Something moved in the hallway, a shadow. She thought she saw something behind her through a reflection in the window, but it seems to have been only in the window. She also saw something across the room by the chair. Kat freaked out and said, okay, I can't do this. We need to turn on the lights. She saw something white like a cloud of smoke over by the chair. So we turned on the lights and decided to promptly leave the room. And that seeing the figure in the window is kind of like when people look in a mirror and you can see something standing behind you, but if you turn around, you can't see it. So it seems like the window was giving the same effect. Janine and her friend Kim investigated in July of 2021 and wrote, Around 1130, Kim and I heard music in the hallway as we were leaving Grumpy's room. Yeah, one of the rooms they called like the old man, old Grumpy's room or something, I guess. That must be the spirit that's in there. As we came to the top of the stairs, we looked down and realized there was a piano playing on the first floor. It played for at least two more minutes until it stopped. Rhea told us the next day one of the piano keys is stuck. The piano is out of tune and the keyboard cover is kept closed. The music we heard that night was perfect. Would love to come back for more. A couple investigated in July of 2021 and captured an interesting video. They wrote, What we didn't know until later is the last video he took right before the EMF started having readings showed a white mist. We didn't see anything with our eyes and didn't know it was there. It looks almost like smoke, but moved different and was passing by him towards where the EMF was. But we didn't know and he had stopped the video recording. We'll post the video and see what you think. And Kelly, here is the video. I want you to watch it and see what you think. Whoa. That's cool. That's really interesting. Too bad they didn't see it in person so that they would keep filming it. Yeah, because you could tell that they kind of cut it off abruptly. It's like just a 15-second video. 
clearly they didn't see it because it's like, no, no, you'd want to keep taping. Absolutely. And it to us, it kind of looks like when you say there's somebody who's smoking on the other side of the camera almost because that's it's just like <laughs> these little wisps of smoke. That exactly are what it out looks every so like. Often. Yeah. We'll put that up on Patreon for our executive producers. And then as this goes out to the free feed, hopefully I will remember to put it up on Instagram, too. Hopefully. Patrick, <laughs> Patrick wrote in January 2022, I've been saying for almost two years, the ghosts leave us alone. I think I need to shut up because, frankly, I have no idea who or what is listening. On January 10th of 2022 at 9 p.m., my wife and son are in the bay window room, first floor, when below them in the locked basement, something was banging on the floor, very loud, and then something sounded like it was tearing through the lower floor. Yeesh. And it's locked, so it's not like somebody's down there. Of course, the fearless duo screamed for me. <laughs> God forbid they turn on the lights and walk down and see. Like on TV, a scary movie, I'm flipping lights on as I descend into the basement with my kinfolk on my back like it's going to help. But nothing. All interior doors are locked. Exterior doors are locked. I blame it on the cat. It's always the cat. Here's the weird part that got me a little spooked. We've got two obnoxious, loud, early warning dogs. Ankle biters. Shark bait. They are growling, not moving, just growling. Then we have a fearless yellow retriever. This big guy will sneak up to you in pitch black and see if he knows you. I've seen him beat three separate pit bulls. I mean, he turns into something that is really scary. He gets so crazy and ugly looking. I told my wife, if he ever does that to me, I'll shoot him. I'm not going to tangle with the psycho Euro dog. Well, he refused to leave the bedroom, was walking in a tight circle, crying. It was crazy. But then it stopped. Everything has been quiet. Something was in the house and the critters knew it. Whoa. Yeah. I always that is trust a little creepy. I always trust the animals, especially the dogs. Definitely. That's why when they start growling and get their hackles up in the middle of the night, I'm like, oh, I hope they just hear the neighbors like talking outside or something. <laughs> Another of his experiences took place outside the house. The most recent experience was not in the building. It was August, pre-dawn, not a full moon, but close. I was outside walking back from the post office when I noticed a white mist the size of a mature St. Bernard one to three feet above the grass, headed down the hill by the shed, across the field, across the road, then towards the main highway B, and vanish. It was big, white, and very fast. They're always fast, come to think of it. Leslie T. wrote in 2022, My name is Leslie T. If you're from around this area, you probably will recognize my last name. My father is John T. He lived in the hotel for a short time when I was a child. I remember I went there and he showed me his room and he showed me the room not to go into right next to his. He also talked about hearing the piano playing music on its own and chairs moving by themselves at night. Are there previous guests from bygone eras still staying at the hotel? Has John Morris been reluctant to leave his home? Has some kind of residual energy been trapped in this hotel? Is Morris Mill Hotel haunted? That is for you to decide. Yeah, it's such a bummer that we can no longer visit this location. Unfortunately, Patrick got Parkinson's. And oh. so that's why they decided that they had to sell. So they did that in 2022. And now it's a private residence. He has his fingers crossed that it eventually opens back up. Lots of great stuff going on here. It sounds like it's pretty crazy. And he would always say, if we don't mess with the ghosts, they don't mess with us. So he wouldn't purposefully try to rile them up but then he did have a lot of people come in and do investigating so it's like you invite people into your house and say hey get the ghost crazy and then they leave and you're stuck with them so. yeah like that 19 year old boy yeah he got his yeah he certainly <laughs> did we want to thank you guys for joining us for this redux i've been your host diane and this has been kelly you take care now Bye bye, bye.